family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism by Melinda Cooper, uh, part one of chapter six. In loco parentis, human capital, student debt, and the logic of family investment. Where does human capital come from? What constitutes a successful investment in human capital, either at the individual or national level? One has to start with the family. That was a quotation from Gary Becker from a book called Human Capital and Poverty. Or, not a book, I guess it would be an article. Or maybe a book, I don't know. The Federal Reserve has not traditionally been interested in the intimate dynamics of households. But as household debt has grown to historically unprecedented levels, and the same debt has come to play a pivotal role in the economies of the United States and the world, acting as both stimulus and Achilles' heel of the global market in asset-backed securities. Central bankers have acquired a new, almost obsessive interest in the living arrangements of young adults. In surveys carried out by the New York Federal Reserve and the Pew Center, researchers have uncovered some striking but not entirely surprising results. Since about the year 2000, many more young people have been lingering at home until late in their 20s, and the numbers have been increasing in a steady, almost linear fashion. The proportion of those under 30 who moved back home to live with their parents or simply opted to stay there increased sharply with the Great Recession of 2007. But while many assumed that the same people would set out on their own once the labor market picked up, the overall trend appears to be impervious to the business cycle. With each passing year, more young people are living at home, irrespective of job prospects. The one overwhelming constant here, according to the Federal Reserve of New York, is the extraordinary burden of student debt held by this generation of under 30s. The total outstanding balance on student debt debt almost tripled between 2004 and 2012, climbing from $364 billion to $966 billion in less than a decade, and proving remarkably resistant to the deflationary effects of financial crisis. While outstanding balances on all other forms of consumer credit, from credit cards to car loans and mortgages, contracted during and after the Great Recession, student debt alone continued to rise at an astonishing rate. These trends are worrying, even from the point of view of the Federal Reserve. Student debt may well constitute a lucrative interest-bearing asset in global securities markets, and it has undoubtedly earned the federal government extraordinary profits in recent years. But it affects, but its effects on household consumption have serious knock-on effects for the overall economy. Until now, much of the momentum behind the consumer credit boom has derived from the expectation that each generation would leave home at roughly the same rate, and in doing so, take out mortgages and consumer credit loans to purchase household goods. By keeping people at home, student debt is having a depressing effect on the entire consumer economy. There is reason to believe that short of decisive political action, the problem will not be resolved any time soon. After all, student debt is in many ways unique. Not only is it excluded from the usual consumer protection laws that would make it dischargeable in bankruptcy, but it is also much more likely to assume a distinctly intergenerational form. As tuition fees have skyrocketed and safer loan options fail to keep up, many more students have been compelled to share their debt burden with parents and other family members. The Federal PLUS loan, which allows parents to take out loans on behalf of students, is one of the fastest growing options in the Federal Loan Program, and one that is disproportionately used by low-income students who have exhausted all other sources of funding. Private student loans have also expanded at a rapid pace and almost invariably require a parent as cosigner. Wealthier parents often find it cheaper to remortgage their homes to pay for their children's college costs rather than take out actual student loans. 
Increasingly, then, student debt is a family affair, binding generations together in webs of mutual obligation and dependence that are quite literally unforgiving. The demographic trends uncovered by the Federal Reserve are but one expression of a new debt-based temporal bind that radically reaffirms the economic function of the private family. The situation could not have been more different in the 1960s when rising federal investment in higher education made college newly accessible to large numbers of women, low-income students, and minorities. The creation of a generous federal grant and loan system, along with a system of public universities offering tuition-free education, made it possible for a generation of students to enter college without relying on family support. This was also a period in which rising wages and expanding public services allowed young adults to attain financial independence earlier than any other time before or after in American history. Neoliberal and neoconservative observers of the 1960s were convinced that these unheard of economic conditions were responsible for the peculiar kinds of radicalism bubbling up on college campuses around the country. Reporting on conditions in the United States for the Trilateral Commission, the neoconservative Samuel Huntington infamously denounced the, de the democratic surge of the 1960s with its general challenge to existing systems of authority, public and private. In one form or another, he observed, this challenge manifested itself in the family, the university, business, public and private associations, politics, the governmental bureaucracy, and the military services. People no longer felt the same compulsion to obey those whom they had previously considered superior to themselves in age, rank, status, expertise, character, or talents. It was particularly visible on college campuses. The single most important variable shaping this dynamic, he ventured, was the dem democratization of higher education. For their part, neoliberal economists such as Milton Friedman and James M. Buchanan all suspected some kind of causal connection between free public education and rising militantism of the student movement. Drawing on the pragmatic insights of rational choice economics, which understands the most antisocial behavior as a, as a rational response to market signals, they sought to show how the creation of free public goods such as education could act as a perverse incentive toward destructive anarchism, and conversely, how the pricing of these same goods could reverse such alarming trends. The question of family was central to neoliberal arguments against public investment in education and key to their proposals for a new economic order powered by private investment and household debt. Both Chicago School human capital theorists and the public choice economists of the Virginia School justified their opposition to public deficit spending by pointing to its role in inciting the anti-authoritarianism of the student movement. Although their arguments often meshed with the overtly moralizing rhetoric of neoconservatives such as Samuel Huntington, the, neo the neoliberals offered a much more adaptive and flexible solution to what they perceived as a threat to inherited wealth and a decline in family responsibility. Neoconservatives would spend the next few decades railing against affirmative action and fighting a cultural war against the new minority disciplines of Black, ethnic, and women's studies. Neoliberal economists also opposed affirmative action as a distortion of the allocative virtues of the free market. But unlike the neoconservatives, they were more interested in the positive task of developing an entirely new model of education funding, one that would replace public with private deficit spending, and in so doing, reinstate the economic obligations of family. Milton Friedman and Gary Becker could not have foreseen how dramatically consumer credit markets would expand in the following decades, nor could they anticipate how closely the student loan market would, ex would approximate their policy prescriptions. But they did understand how private credit markets could perform democratic inclusion without disturbing the economic strictures of private family wealth or economic structures of private family wealth. To fully grasp the novelty of their position, we need to turn to the early history of neoliberal human capital theory, 
which for many years was overshadowed by its more successful neo keynesian rival. Vicissitudes of Human Capital Theory Today, human capital theory is almost synonymous with Chicago School neoliberalism, thanks in large part to the publication of Foucault's seminars at the Collège de France. In the late 1950s and 1960s, however, the concept of human capital was much more closely associated with the name of Theodore Schultz, an economist who worked alongside Milton Friedman and Gary Becker at the University of Chicago, but who would be more accurately described as a neo keynesian of the likes of Paul Samuelson, Robert Solow, and Richard Musgrave. It was Schultz who first popularized the idea that spending on human services such as education should be considered an investment rather than an act of consumption, and therefore that education itself should be considered a form of capital or interest-bearing asset. Specifically, Schultz believed that investment in education could help explain a hitherto perplexing problem in the calculation of national economic growth, one that had been identified by the founding figure of neoclassical growth economics, Robert Solow. In two seminal articles in the field, Solow reported that only a small part of the rapid economic growth of the United States in the early 20th century could be attributed to increases in the size of the labor force or physical capital, the sources of investment traditionally thought to account for GDP growth. Solow concluded that the part of economic growth not accounted for by investments in labor or physical capital could be described as the residual and explained by the efficiency with which labor and physical capital were used. He surmised that the residual was primarily a function of technological progress, although his model could not explain where this progress came from or how it could be improved. Theodore Schultz, for his part, thought that he had a much more plausible explanation for the discrepancies uncovered by Salau. The residual gave a name to our ignorance, but could not dispel it. The problem could be resolved, however, if one took into account the sustained increase in private and public investments in education that had occurred over this period, an increase that was not the result of any conscious policy decision, but that nevertheless had had the desirable effect of greatly improving GDP. Human capital investment, then, was the missing production factor in growth economics. Schultz's insights led him to a number of practical conclusions regarding the role of public investment in education. First, he reasoned that if haphazard investment in higher education had been responsible for such a large portion of national economic growth, that the federal government would be well advised to adopt an active policy of sustained investment in the sector. Second, he argued that selective underinvestment in the education of the working class, African Americans, and women could account for the labor market discrimination experienced by these demographics. Underinvestment in education was not only a source of economic, racial, and gender inequality, it was also a waste of national human resources that could have greatly increased GDP had they been deployed. Unlike his colleagues Friedman and Becker, Schultz was convinced that the federal government had a vital role to play in the field of higher education. When Friedman commenting on one of Schultz's drafts, asked him the critical question of whether returns to investment in education accrued primarily to the individual or the collective, Schultz replied that such investment raised national income and was therefore in the interests of the public as a whole. The public provision of free education, moreover, enabled rich and poor to attend college, independently of family wealth. The corresponding increase in wages for poor students could be justified in the same way as progressive taxation. As an academic economist, Theodore Schultz exerted an unusual influence on government policy, thanks largely to the enthusiastic translational work of Walter Heller, a public finance economist who served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Kennedy and Johnson. Heller had been instrumental in persuading Eisenhower that increased investment in higher education was a necessary weapon in the Cold War struggle against the Soviet Union. In a consultation paper on fiscal policy delivered a few weeks after the launch of Sputnik II, Heller famously argued that only a sustained commitment to public education could generate the quantity of brain power needed to compete with the Soviet Union.
Invoking what were then mainstream ideas about the economic role of the state, he identified military prowess and national security as positive externalities that only public investment could hope to provide. After his nomination to the Council of Economic Advisers in 1960, and having encountered the work of Theodore Schultz, Heller modified his security-focused arguments in favor of higher, of higher education, now pushing for further public investment as a means of stimulating economic growth and overcoming inequality. Thanks to Heller's advocacy, thanks to Heller's advocacy, the idea that the federal gov- government should play a more, a much more direct and generous role in financing higher education became a mainstay of neo-Keynesian public finance economics. Richard Musgrave, the founder of modern public finance and a close associate of Heller, integrated Schultz's ideas into his theory of public investment to argue that adequate provision for educational services is of prime importance to the nation's safety and welfare. In Musgrave's work, The Imperatives of National Security, Economic Competitiveness, and democratic inclusion converged in apparently seamless fashion to render federal investment in education an urgent task of public public policy. The events of recent years, he remarked, have shown that the maintenance and strengthening of educational standards is of greatest importance for the future of our country. These educational services are needed not only as a means towards obtaining a fuller life, but as a condition of national survival. For one thing, the revolution of weapons technology over the last decades has rendered scientific advance and training a crucial, perhaps the most crucial element in national defense. For another, our leadership in the Western world requires that our economy continue to grow at an adequate rate so as to maintain our position of relative economic strength in the world. Investment in human capital through education is the most important and direct way of accomplishing these objectives. Moreover, among all policies to stimulate growth, that of advancing education is most in line with the social objectives and ideals of our society. By 1960, then, some combination of Schultz's human capital theory and Musgravian public finance economics had become the received wisdom among representatives of the Council of Economic Advisors, and it was this institution in particular that can be credited with inspiring President Johnson's astonishing commitment to public education. During his term in office, Johnson presided over the most dramatic expansion in higher education in the nation's history, overseeing dozens of laws designed to increase federal spending and democratize access. The centerpiece of Johnson's reform efforts, the Higher Education Act, HEA, of 1965, gave the federal government authority over almost every aspect of the nation's higher education system, doubled the federal budget for higher education, and imparted a coherent vision of democratic inclusion to the sector as a whole. The HEA pumped federal aid into impoverished black colleges, oversaw the creation of student recruitment programs and bridging courses for disadvantaged students, increased the number of grants available to low-income students, and created a program of guaranteed student loans to be subsidized by the federal government. In a final bid to ensure the redistributive objectives of federal aid, in 1972, Senator Claiborne Pell convinced Congress to approve a program of low-income grants, renamed Pell Grants in 1980, which would be administered directly by the federal government rather than allocated by, by colleges. These policies had the effect of welcoming unprecedented numbers of low-income Black, Latino, and women students into colleges and universities, a demographic shift that would soon be reflected in the political and pedagogical demands of the student movement. As Schultz had foreseen, sustained federal investment in higher education functioned much like an inheritance tax. By redistributing the costs of education through the tax base, Johnson had made it possible for students without family wealth to access an institution that had once been a major conduit of class reproduction. During the 1970s, Pell grants were generous enough to cover both tuition fees and living costs, liberating students from the need to rely on the contributions of their parents. For a brief moment, the expansion of public investment in education replaced private 
family investment as a means of access to education. From the beginning, Schultz had his critics. Milton Friedemann and Gary Becker in particular developed a perspective on human capital that highlighted the value of private as opposed to public returns to investment and led to policy recommendations as complete variants with those of Schultz. Recommendations at complete variance with those of Schultz. As early as 1945, Milton Friedemann and Simon Kuznets were weighing up the costs and benefits of higher education by seeking to measure the precise returns to workers who had invested in some form of professional training. Their study found evidence of significant wage differentials between college-educated and non-educated workers that more than justified the opportunity costs incurred by students who did not earn a wage during their college years. Although the article excluded a discussion of publicly funded education, the authors did raise two questions that have since become critical to policy debates around human capital funding. First, how much public investment is needed? Second, should the returns from public investment accrue to the individuals in whose training the investment was made? Without offering an explicit response to the first question, Friedemann and Kuznets suggested that in an ideal world, existing inequalities in education and wages could be resolved entirely through the private capital markets. With a few changes to corporate law, students could, per could be persuaded to sell stock in themselves and obligated to pay a portion of their future wages as dividends to their public of stockholders. In this remarkable passage, Friedemann and Kuznets see students not so much as investors in their own capital as corporations selling a stake in their human capital to outside investors, a vision that has now in large part been realized, albeit in the form of debt rather than equity-based finance, and crucially without the usual corporate protections of limited liability or bankruptcy laws. In their 1962 book, Capitalism and Freedom, Rose and Milton Friedemann came out even more decisively in favor of private investment in human capital. Here they argue that the returns to investment in education accrued entirely to the individual student and that any ostensible social benefits were merely the summation of private wage gains. The individual student should therefore be held responsible for the costs of his education. The Friedemans concurred with Schultz that there had been massive underinvestment in higher education, but unlike Schultz, they believed that this failure could be remedied through the liberalization of credit. The fact that low-income students were unable to pay for a degree and thus discriminated against in the labor market could be attributed to imperfections in the capital market, that is, the absence of a liquid market in private student loans. At best, the Friedemans conceded that the state might play a minimal role in remedying this state of affairs by providing loans repayable through the tax system and contingent on future earnings. But they clearly saw the private credit market as the most efficient source of funding for student loans and thought that government incentives to banks were the best way of stimulating this market. Gary Becker, who was always especially attentive to the micro-political dimensions of public policy, developed an elaborate argument as to why private familial investment in the education of children was more efficient than public investment. Free public education, he argued, could be critiqued on the same grounds as the progressive income tax, which initially narrows inequality by reducing the variability in after-tax incomes, but ends up raising the equilibrium level of inequality because families reduce their investments in descendants. The argument was improbable and at odds with the empirical evidence, but it enabled Becker to identify private credit markets as a logical and, he insisted, equally redistributive alternative. In Becker's ideal world, students would once again need to look to the family as a source of economic support, and yet the old, once implacable stratifications of family wealth would simultaneously be deferred and elasticized, by expanding opportunities for private debt. Becker's micropolitical perspective on human capital investment was a mirror image of the more familiar theories of the Chicago and Virginia school neoliberals, who famously argued that public deficit spending and the resulting national debt had the unfortunate effect of crowding out private credit markets and discouraging private investment. But whereas Milton Friedman and James M. Buchanan were primarily referring to business investment, what Becker meant by private investment was intergenerational, 
family investment. If the government would only scale back on its investments in public goods, Becker surmised, then the family would resume its proper role of investing in children. Further than this, the family's traditional... Further than this, the family's traditional economic responsibility in ensuring the welfare of its members would be greatly expanded by the stimulation of appropriate credit markets. With a little help from government, the old poor law tradition of family responsibility could be reinvented in the form of an infinitely elastic intergenerational debt. Although although well-respected within the empirical literature, Friedman and Becker's theories of human capital had little political traction in the 1960s, when Johnson was ratcheting up federal investment in the nation's human capital and opening up public universities to a new generation of disadvantaged students. Throughout the 1960s, Schultz's ideas radiated outward. At the Washington OECD Conference of 1961, member countries issued a resounding endorsement of Schultzian human capital theory. Throughout the decade, UN agencies promoted his ideas as models of sound economic growth and encouraged post-colonial states to put them into practice. By 1970, however, this consensus was already faltering as governments began to feel the effects of rising inflation and dwindling economic confidence. At the... At the Paris OECD conference of 1970s, representatives expressed a more cautious outlook on the slower returns from higher education. In the United States, a handful of economists reported that wage growth among college graduates had actually slowed, seeming to contradict the self-evidence of Schultz's predictions. Alongside the growing militancy of the student movement, these economic trends troubled the once stable consensus that free public education was an unmitigated social good. As noted by Simon Marginson, public education in this period faced the conflation of a resource crisis and a legitimation crisis. In the very different recessionary environment of the 1970s, the ideas of Friedman and Becker came out of the cold and found increasing resonance among policymakers. The election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 marked the final triumph of Chicago School Human Capital Theory, the moment when neoliberal ideas about the financing of higher education were first enacted on a federal scale and student debt became central to the experience of college life. But long before he became president, Reagan had experimented with these ideas in the policy laboratory of California when he first encountered the Berkeley student movement of the 1960s. The student movement protesting human capital and in loco parentis. In the fall of 1964, a new kind of student radicalism flared up at the University of California at Berkeley its aftershocks reverberating across other state campuses over the following months and years. The concentration of student protests at Berkeley was significant given its widely recognized status as a model of the new knowledge-based university and an exemplar of Johnson-era federal investment in human capital. In the late 1950s, the University of California was beholden to the institutional vision of Clark Kerr, a former labor economist and champion of Schultzian human capital theory, who was appointed chancellor of of Berkeley in 1952 and president of the entire University of California, UC, system in 1958. As President Kerr famously endorsed the landmark 1960 Master Plan for Higher Education in California, which preserved the UC institutions as the state's preeminent public research universities and affirmed the principle of free college access for residents of the state who were to be charged only minimal administrative fees. As a labor economist, Kerr had specialized in the resolution of industrial conflicts through collective bargaining. By the time of his, empo- by the time of his appointment as Chancellor of Berkeley in 1952, his attention had shifted to the importance of knowledge in modern economic growth.
Throughout his tenure at the University of California, he worked on a series of large Ford Foundation grants, exploring the transition from an economy of mass production to a knowledge economy, in which human resources would be the driving force of economic growth. The consummate mediator, Kerr, predicted that as the university replaced the factory as the prime locus of post-industrial accumulation, the antinomies between capital and labor would dissolve of their own accord. Taking stock of the new generation of intellectual workers, represented by the students of the University of California, Kerr saw no reason to fear any possibility of conflict. Kerr published his most iconic statement on the knowledge economy, the uses of the university, in 1963, just one year before the free speech movement erupted on the Berkeley campus. Written at a time when student numbers were skyrocketing and the federal government was promising to dramatically increase its investments in the sector, Kerr's blueprint for the public research university succinctly distilled the lessons of Schultzian human capital theory. The university is being called upon to educate previously unimagined numbers of students. He noted, Today, more than ever, education is inextricably involved in the quality of a nation. It has been estimated that over the last 30 years, nearly half of our national growth can be explained by the greater education of our people and by better technology, which is also largely a product of the educational system. Basic to this transformation is the growth of the knowledge industry, which is coming to permeate government and business into drawing to it more and more people raised to higher and higher levels of skill. The production, distribution, and consumption of knowledge in all its forms is said to account for 29% of gross natural, national product. According to Fritz's, Fritz Maclup's calculations, and knowledge production is growing at about twice the rate of the rest of the economy. Knowledge has certainly never in history been so central to the conduct of an entire society. What the railroads did for the second half of the last century and the automobile for the first half of this century may be done for the second half of this century by the knowledge industry. That is to serve as the focal point for national growth, and the university is at the center of the knowledge process. Although Kerr was determined to include low-income minority and female students within the new knowledge-based university, his social progressivism was allied with a highly instrumental nationalist vision of academic knowledge production. There was no doubt in his mind that the emerging generation of knowledge workers would primarily be of service to the petrochemical, agrochemical, and defense industries, the agents of America's neo-colonial wars in Southeast Asia. In keeping with the double vision of the Johnson administration, which had launched the war on poverty at the same time it embarked on a disastrous war in Vietnam, Kerr saw, or Kerr saw public investment in human capital as serving the dual ends of domestic social justice and national security. When the student revolt erupted in the following year, it was precisely this conflation that came under attack. Referring directly to the uses of the university, Mario Savo, Savio, a prominent figure in the Berkeley free speech movement, accused Kerr of turning students into the raw material of a new knowledge factory, an assembly line where all the rough edges are taken off and smooth, slick products come out. Steeped in Frankfurt School humanism, Savio appealed to a more traditional educational philosophy that would no longer be plugged into the military and the industrial, but would instead seek out truth. Beyond these romantic denunciations of the knowledge factory, however, the student revolt also generated a more pointed critique of Johnson-era human capital theory. Johnson's, inclu Johnson's inclusive higher education policy had unwittingly produced a generation of students who perfectly understood the connections between domestic race relations and anti-communism abroad and who refused the cozy relationship between the public research university and American imperialism. Students who took part in the Freedom Rides of 1964 brought the civil rights movement back to the North and promptly organized actions against local businesses that discriminated against Blacks. Beginning in Wisconsin, students launched campaigns against Dow Chemical, the producer of napalm, and a host of other defense contractors who regularly recruited, recruited on American campuses, while anti-draft actions targeted the many high school students and graduates who would soon be eligible for conscription.
the civil rights and anti-war movements were connected in more ways than one. Not only did the former serve as a training ground for a new generation of activists, but the escalation of the war in Vietnam also reduced funding for domestic anti-poverty programs and sent, a dis and sent a disproportionate number of blacks to the front lines of battle. At a time when third world anti-imperialism veered toward the left rather than the right, the domestic dissent was casually classified as communist. The synergies between American race relations and imperialist geopolitics appeared transparent. Yet student protests during this period also focused to a, to a remarkable degree on the micropolitics of gender, race, and sexuality, as embodied in the peculiar tradition of in loco parentis rules on university campuses. The idea that college administrators were somehow endowed with the custodial powers of parents and therefore authorized to act in loco parentis was a very old one on American campuses, but it had been re reinvigorated in the early 20th century when a court ruling gave colleges wide powers to expel students without due process. Throughout the mid-20th century, in loco parentis rules transplanted the intimate norm normativity of the Fortis family into a wider institutional context, radiating its disciplines well beyond the confines of the family home into the liminal social space of the college campus, where students were considered neither complete adults nor children. In loco parentis allowed administrators and dorm officials to restrict the political activities of students, to regulate behavior, dress, and alcohol consumption, and to police sexuality. Controlled heteronormativity was the rule here. In an effort to protect women, contact between male and female students in college dorms was tightly regulated, while students could be expelled on the mere suspicion of homosexuality. The weight of surveillance bore down on female students in particular, who were subject to much stricter curfews and dress rules than their male counterparts and frequently, frequently scrutinized by both their peers and superiors. In the South, black students came to see in loco parentis as a form of institutionalized infantilism, 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 infantilism a way of imposing norms of respectability and deference that were all too familiar as an expression of racial submission. Their mistrust was further reinforced when in loco parentis rules were invoked to suppress civil rights activism on Southern campuses. The struggle against in loco parentis was a formative experience for the new student left and the various liberation movements that splintered off from it. These movements subjected the racial and sexual normativity of the Fortis family to relentless critique and explored the ways in which its intimate hierarchies pervaded the larger institutional space of the university. In his account of the epistemological revolution of the 1960s, Roderick Ferguson remarks that what in Europe took the form of a largely intellectual challenge to disciplinary norms, exemplified by the work of Michel Foucault, in North America assumed the much more radical guise of comprehensive social insurrection. The new student left, after all, emerged out of a historic shift in the demographics of the student population, and this shift was in turn reflected in the rise of movements demanding not simply inclusion in existing structures, but a wholesale remaking of the institution itself. In campuses across the country, feminist, st feminist students called for or initiated an immediate end to in loco parentis rules, affirmative action in admissions and hiring, information on birth control and abortion at student health centers, on-campus rape crisis centers, the creation of new women's studies programs, and the revision of the curriculum. And beyond affirmative action, Black, Native American, and Latino students called for a thorough overhaul of both the curriculum and pedagogical practice to better reflect the historical collusion between racism and capital in American history. Without wanting to underplay the tensions between these various liberation movements, much less deny the normative and nationalist recuperations that occurred within them, together what they signaled was an, an effort to rethink the entire institutional structure of the university, from its demographics to its curriculum and, uh, and administrative structures.
from the point of view of Fordism's non-normative subjects. These movements were both a product of the Fordist era democratization of higher education and radically in excess of its nationalist objectives. In one sense, it is obvious that they simply would not have existed without Johnson's enormous infusion of public money into higher education and the efforts of liberal administrators such as UC President Kerr to maintain a free state university system. But for the most part, and with good reason, the student radicals of the 1960s saw these reformers as their enemies, enablers of the Cold War military-industrial state who may have opened up higher education to America's minorities, but who had done so with the aim of furthering American imperialism and domestic anti-communism. Clark Kerr, in particular, had demonstrated numerous times that he was all too willing to compromise with the existing organization of American capitalism. Although he valiantly withstood pressure from the House on American Activities Committee to censor campus speakers, Kerr was always prompt to offer concessions to the other side, insisting, for instance, that left-wing speakers should be followed by anti-communists as a demonstration of even-handedness. In an era of rising prosperity, <clears throat> it was perhaps difficult to imagine that within a few short years the student critique of Fordist capitalism would be outflanked from the right by a new class of political actor intent on doing the public funding of education entirely. Thus, when Clark Kerr was finally ousted from the University of California, it was with the blessing of Ronald Reagan rather than the student protesters.